Hello and uh, welcome to the launch of this uh, new vintage of the OECD's inter-country, inter-output uh, ICIO tables and trade in uh, value-added uh, TIVA database. Um, we are honored to have uh, delegates from the OECD Committee on Industry, Innovation and Entrepreneurship, the CIIE, joining us in the room, but also uh, a few hundred participants online. So welcome to them as well. Um, let me start by uh, saying that the ICIO database is a very versatile, very flexible analytical tool that uh, is extremely helpful in measuring different dimensions of economic linkages between countries. The annual tables are also providing a very globally balanced view of inter-country, inter-industry flows of intermediate and uh, final goods and services. And this is underpinning a range of applications uh, related, uh, for example, to global value chains. And I must say that uh, it's an honor for me to chair this meeting in my role as uh, Chief Economist of the European Commission's Directorate General for Internal Market uh, and Industry and, uh, and Vice Chair of the, of the CIIE uh, Committee, because at the Commission we are also overseeing research that uh, makes great and relentless uh, use of these uh, resources that we're discussing today, for example, to measure phenomena related to the impact of the energy crisis on the EU industrial ecosystems, spillover effects across the internal market, economic exposures of the EU to third uh, country disruptions in different instances. So just to say that we are big fans of the ICIO TIVA uh, kind of database. So basically just to let you know in terms of organization that during today's launch, there will be two opportunities for participants to ask questions. A first one after the overview of the new databases and the related collections of indicators that will be given by the OECD's uh, colleague Nori Yamano, moderated by Paul Schreier, the OECD's uh, chief statistician. And then after the panel discussion moderated by Marion Janssen, directors of the, director of the OECD's uh, Trade and Agriculture Directorate, so for these two rounds of questions, delegates present in the room are encouraged to raise their country name, their country flag, and attendees on Zoom can submit questions using the Q&A function in Zoom. But first of all, and before going ahead, I am delighted to welcome as well uh, Jerry Sheehan, the director of the OECD's Directorate for Science, Technology and Innovation, STI. He will be providing to you a few uh, welcome remarks and kick off the launch of, the, uh, of today's event. So Jerry, please, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Roman. Oh, sorry. There we go. Thank you, Roman. Thank you uh, to all of you for being here with us for uh, for the launch of the new vintage of Tiva today. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to have this opportunity to offer you a few remarks. And I'll say at the beginning, I'm going to offer my remarks, and unfortunately, I'll have to leave before the the real discussion gets underway. But I look forward to hearing back about the the rich and productive discussions uh, today. I'm also very pleased to be joined by my two of my colleagues here, Marian Janssen, from the, who's the Director for Trade and Agriculture here at the OECD, and Paul Schreier, OECD's Chief Statistician and Director of the Statistics and Data Directorate. It's really through the effective collaboration with these partners and others that we're able to make TIVA a reality and bring to you this new version of it that we're launching today. It's worth noting that OECD's work uh, on internationally comparable national input output tables traces back more than 30 years into the 1990s, originally to measure international technology spillovers. Paul might have been involved in some of that early, early work as well, <laughs> and is another vintage uh, from, from those, uh, those years. Uh, and, and it took a turn in, in 2008, following the financial crisis, when policymakers worldwide called for new metrics to better understand the global collapse in international trade. And recognizing, I think, OECD's experience with the input-output analyses, they asked OECD to develop measures of trade in value added, or TIVA. Our first TIVA database was released 10 years ago, in 2013, uh, with which much uh, acclaim and much praise. And at the time, it included 40 countries, covering 18 industries, and three years worth of data. Since then, it's grown so that we now, in the version we're releasing today, will cover 76 countries, 45 industries, and 26 years of data. So that's a significant expansion. 
It's worth noting that just since the 2021 edition, 10 new countries have been added to TIVA, including five African countries, which is an outcome of a recently completed joint project with the WTO and UNICA. And as a result, I think we now cover 50 to 60% of total African GDP. Ukraine has also been added. And understanding Ukraine's global and regional linkages, we hope will help in discussions related to reconstruction when hostilities end. With these additions, TIVA now covers about 95% of global GDP and about 80% of the world's population. But we're seeing interesting results. The TIVA database reveals the origin of value added both in domestic and foreign in countries' gross exports and in their final demand for goods and services. And it can help support policymakers that, who are trying to answer questions like, what are the ultimate origins of the goods and services that you consume? Whose demand drives reproduction activities in your country? This is particularly important as recent global events have increased interest in understanding economic dependencies that, and to help shape industry and trade policies toward more resilient regional and global supply chains. The intercountry input output or ICIO tables open the door to a wide range of analyses, including other global value chain related indicators beyond TIVA. And for example, they allow us to measure greenhouse gas emissions that are embodied in final demand for goods and, so and products. This can help us determine if countries are reducing their domestic consumption of emissions, as well as their production. Recently, OECD has extended this field of work to analyze and understand cross-country and cross-sectoral impacts of the new border uh, carbon adjustment mechanisms and the more established carbon tax regimes. We have trade and employment indicators that can reveal how foreign final demand drives domestic employment. And going further, how men and women in the workforce are involved in different ways directly and indirectly affecting global value chains. The ICIO tables also form the basis of analysis of the global supply chains of, of targeted detailed sectors. For example, recent work at OECD on, and ongoing work on semiconductor supply chains. We're combining ICIO tables with product level trade data from UN ComTrade to allow us to better map granular GVC vulnerabilities and conduct stress testing. OECD has also led the development of the analytical AMNI database, which allows analysis of the role of multinational enterprises and GVCs. And recent efforts have been made to develop novel indicators to map dependencies based on gross output trade indicators. And for example, reveal foreign market reliance and foreign input reliance. We often receive requests to continue to increase the geographical coverage of TIVA. And to be included in the TIVA database requires a wide range of national statistics for input to help us construct the ICIO tables. And we actively work with various partners to help countries understand these requirements and to work toward maximizing the coverage and the quality of the statistics that are included in the ICO TIVA collections. We have long benefited from work of other organizations to advance our work here on ICIO. Recent initiative has enhanced collaboration with the European Union, the IMF, the ADB, UN, and, and World Trade Organization. This so-called giant initiative that emerged from the regional and global TIVA project aims to share experiences, coordinate capacity building, and converge sources and methods for building multi-country input-output tables. And of course, the Input-Output Association has long been a source of inspiration. So we hope you'll be able to make great use of these new and updated resources in this new vintage of TIVA. To those who may be new to it, we also hope our country notes are useful and encourage work on regional and global value chains wherever you are. And finally, I'd like to once again thank the OECD teams involved for the phenomenal efforts over the past years to reach this point and to reach this version of TIVA. Uh, unless you yourself have built multi-country input-output tables uh, covering 25 years or more, it's, it's not easy to appreciate how complex and difficult this is. And it does take quite a team internal to our STI directorate and, and across our colleagues here in, in trade and agriculture and in the statistics directorate and all the other organizations I, I mentioned. So we, our teams deserve a lot of credit and thanks for bringing us this latest uh, edition of TIVA. I hope that you will make good use of it in the work that you do in the many ways that it can be put to good use to inform policy and inform good policy analysis. 
let me close just by offering you all uh, a good discussion, uh, an exciting launch event for this new database. Thank you very much. And thanks for being here today. Thank you very much, uh, Jerry, for uh, emphasizing the importance and the great usefulness of the inter-country input, output, and TIVA databases. You highlighted, among other issues, how the country and time coverage is substantially expanded in a very impressive way, and how useful this um, tool is to measure aspects such as supply chain vulnerabilities, to do stress testing around supply chains, but also to better understand dependencies like we have seen in the recent presentation at the CIAE or employment dynamics. And indeed, you know, I mean, you put your finger on the fact that it's a very complex endeavor that is very smoothly managed by the OECD Secretariat. So now I would like to invite uh, Nori Yamano to present the new vintage of the OECD intercountry input output tables, Antiva and other global value chain related indicators. Nori is actually leading the work on the construction of the ICIO tables undertaken in the OECD's Directorate for Science, Technology and Innovation. So Nori, please, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. Um, so um, thank you all for uh, coming to this event. Uh, I would um, briefly mention about uh, the new update of the OECD input output uh, tables with uh, TIVA data indicators. I mentioned uh, several names here uh, as a presenter, but the, all of the work uh, I mentioned today is also beyond the compilation team of the ICIO model. And uh, I tried to mention in the following slides. Anyway, um, so let's start with uh, the history. Uh, as the director said, uh, we started this work from the early 1990s uh, with the different uh, policy areas, uh, starting from technology spillovers, uh, climate change issues. And then in the uh, about 10 years ago, we started the indicator called trading value added uh, indicators. Now, uh, this uh, indicator TIVA is uh, expanded to uh, different dimensions like uh, jobs, employment, um, the other type of the environmental issues, and also uh, ownership of the multinational companies and the uh, different type of the indicators uh, on the production network itself. And then the uh, recent uh, shift in the narrative is also uh, evident. Um, for example, uh, there is uh, uh, the differences in like uh, the geopolitics and the uh, energy issues, uh, food securities. Those are also uh, different from what we started about uh, 10 years ago. And we also try to cover uh, these uh, new areas in the uh, different indicators. And for the uh, update, uh, we started with uh, 40 countries, uh, uh, three years, uh, 18 industries uh, in 2013. Now we have uh, 76 countries, 26 years, 45 industries. That makes us its huge database. And the, again, uh, uh, it took uh, some time to really come up to uh, this point, and there were some revisions we had to make uh, since uh, last year. So for that 76 uh, countries, uh, we can just make it to the smaller uh, framework in this uh, conceptual diagram, showing that these three countries, two industries, is basically, it is similar to the national input up system or the supply use system. But uh, it covers uh, basically the global economy, uh, 76 countries plus rest of the world. And then we have the uh, all the try to put all the uh, information, the official data for the value the GDP output. And then it has a, a complete picture of the how the uh, countries, industry structures are connected to each other. So, um it's similar to the previous one so we now have a uh, uh, 76 countries so that we can also uh, have the indicators on the region groups such as uh, oecd 38 members uh, g20 or eu countries and asean countries are included here and also uh the most maybe important uh, message here is we are now able to include 10 new countries 
Um, this is uh, in the small box here. It shows the uh, five from Africa uh, to, I mean, three from Asia, the, the largest population countries. So that's also important for us, some policy areas. And also to cover the uh, Eastern Europe or to complete the Eastern European economies so that uh, we can have a better analysis on the uh, different policy issues. And the underlying format is similar to the previous one. Uh, it is a 2008 SNA and the ICIC revision for in the uh, industry classifications. And now also important to say that we now have a, a country notes uh, for all the target countries, uh, 76 countries. So that's, uh, I think, a good uh, improvement compared to the previous one. So um, there might be some questions from the floor or the online people that what are the last uh, few months about the where the revisions and the, where the previous one gone. So there were a few uh, revisions uh, from since, uh, last year. Uh, maybe one or two revised numbers. The most uh, evident reason was that the the number was uh, official data used uh, national accounts, um, trade statistics, and they really changed uh, in the last one or two years uh, due to the um, changes in the uh, COVID time uh, numbers. So that, uh, for example, uh, countries are changing the subsidies uh, allocation to different location in the national accounts or the uh, input output table so that uh, we were trying to capture what is the latest. And so that also changes a lot of the uh, divisions. And also uh, some of the countries I mentioned, they were able to provide us a lot of information in the bilateral meetings since uh, last autumn to summer this year. So those uh, new databases are now also integrated in the latest number we have in the November. And then, uh, of course, uh, we were trying to uh, modify the underlying system so that we can have a, a better update with a more timely uh, manner in the uh, from the next year. So uh, this example of the TVA indicators are not so different uh, compared to the previous one. Um, so we try to keep the, all the uh, basic indicators as it is, like uh, foreign variated content of gross exports, domestic variated content of the foreign exports, and the uh, service content or the individual sectors content in the uh, exports and the, uh, foreign demand. And then uh, there is a, the last one is about the decomposition of the gross exports. And then uh, there are a few more uh, indicators, maybe for the exports, uh, we call it a um, variated by source country and industries. Those could be also useful to have a, a better understanding on the uh, global value chains. Okay. So this is uh, one example uh, people usually refer to is this, um, what is a, a foreign variated share in the gross exports. And this is to show the uh, indicators. Um, we were discussing about this uh, recently about which type is a uh, best to present in here, but uh, we pick uh, this chart for uh, this event. Um, we may not see that much change from 19, 2019 to 2020, but it's really due to the mixture of the uh, composition of uh, indicators. So if we sum up with a weighted weight in the, the total figures, you may not see that much change, but if you see the individual country, individual industries, we see the big change, of course, due to the um, COVID time. But anyway, um, so just goes quickly to uh, different charts. Um, those are also uh, available in the country nodes uh, we mentioned earlier, so um, you can look at them uh, later. And this is about the foreign variated content of manufacturing gross exports. Um, of course, uh, this indicator is uh, 
depends on the position of a global value chain of each country and also the size and the, what type of product they are producing. So it is uh, really uh, uh, the typical indicators we usually publish. And then the next one is about the, oops, yeah, the backward participation in global value chains. So if we zoom into the, um, the foreign part of the uh, value chains, uh, we can also see the uh, what are the sources of the uh, foreign contents. And uh, it is usually uh, some necessity goods, for example, food and textile products are made in the regional value chains. And then the more complex uh, products such as motor vehicles, transport equipment, uh, those are a more global uh, production networks that require to produce goods. And it also appears in uh, this uh, type of the chart. And if it takes uh, as a by region, like EU countries, of course, it depends more on the EU neighbors. And um, Asia depends on Asian networks. But uh, some of the new countries are uh, mentioned uh, from the developing economies. Uh, we still see uh, a relatively weak uh, supply chains in the uh, these uh, recently uh, include target countries. So they are. Uh, I think there are a lot of uh, discussion in the different uh, uh, bodies in the OECD to discuss more how those economies can be uh, better integrated in regional and global value chains. So, and then uh, the last one on the TIVA is about the uh, origin of value in domestic final demand. So this uh, chart basically shows um, the foreign dependencies on the uh, energy and the food uh, so it's related to the security issues and um, to see how uh, countries uh, depends more or less on the energy and agriculture uh, value added uh, in the foreign market if these foreign countries are within the customs union the trade union then there might be not that issue but if it's coming from the far away from the different continent or different uh, countries, then we might see the uh, more uh, issues in the, in terms of the this, uh, food and energy security. So that's uh, something we were able to, or you are able to get this uh, easily from our uh, TIVA indicators. So beyond uh, TIVA indicators, uh, there are many uh, application in the OECD using this uh, model and the indicators uh, from uh, different part of the uh, committees, uh, including and also there is uh, some uh, specific uh, industry uh, oriented um, committees like steel shipbuilding. They are also using this and like tourism too. So and also uh, it's important to see that uh, this kind of analysis now more than just OECD, but used by many other international organizations, um, EU, uh, WTO, uh, UN meetings. Okay. So uh, for the other indicators, we also included a greenhouse gas uh, footprint this time, uh, including the uh, non-fuel uh, combustion uh, emissions uh, this time. It changes a bit of the picture here compared to the previous uh, uh, CO2 only analysis because of the energy and the agriculture sectors have a lot of uh, greenhouse gas, not just coming from the uh, fuel combustion. So that was the, this kind of a per capita emission picture may change uh, a bit. And also we can see that in the uh, slight changes in from the previous uh, TECO2 database. Now uh, this uh, CO2 equivalent of the total GHG uh, has a slightly different picture for all countries. And this is also included in the uh, country note. Uh, and it's uh, a joint work, of course, with uh, other colleagues, Ricardo, Michel. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, these people also helped us um, creating the employment sustained by foreign final demand. And it's now uh, up to 2020. Employment is one of the most difficult indicators in this uh, set because of the uh, employment by sectors are not really available for many developing countries, but we are now trying to uh, expand the coverage so that we can see the 
a different type of the employment. And also this work is now um, trying to capture the workforce by characteristics such as gender, age, and the skill set. And that could be also uh, introduced when we have the more data. And another uh, important extension was uh, this uh, gross output linkage in global value chains. In okay. these other T by indicators are mainly focus on the final demand in the foreign countries or the uh, gross export. But also it's in, now important to understand the production chains itself. And I think one of the, maybe if you are attended the previous uh, committee meeting, um, OECD, CIAE, and there was uh, one from the uh, pass-through frequency index by Satoshi Nomata. But also this is another extension by uh, Antoine Lea and Anton, uh, my colleagues here. Uh, uh, now able to provide the uh, whole this country's uh, foreign reliance indicators, both in the input side and market side, to see how uh, countries are depend on uh, foreign economies to produce the uh, global value chain oriented um, products. Now it's almost final. Um, so another extension. Uh, was done is to uh, split the ownership information in the uh, trade and agriculture directorate. And uh, this work is, uh, of course, mainly done by uh, Sebastian, Mati, and Carmen about uh, to see how the uh, foreign owned companies uh, depends more on the imports. So, this uh, it's really clear to see the in, uh, important message about the product uh, processing trade and also to see the production productivity issues uh, could be different by uh, ownership. And that's also available uh, online with this uh, website and the publications should be also available. And then uh, all these uh, the example charts I mentioned today is uh, included in the uh, new country notes and it should be um, already online. And uh, today, or maybe tomorrow, yeah, today should be uh, available, yes. Um, then uh, to summarize, um, so the next step is to um, immediately we will um, finalize the ICN and TIBA materials uh, online. Um, we start from the TIBA indicators, but also uh, we also publish them, uh, the, our model, ICIO itself too. And then from next year, we try to have a next uh, update of the ICIO table and TIBA indicators as always, and probably try to include a few more uh, developing countries in, in the model. And then of course, uh, we will try to uh, have uh, more indicators, uh, including the, the work um, done by uh, uh, SDD, Statistic Directory, Directorate on the uh, more up to date uh, information of the uh, ICIO and ICIO itself. Okay, um, so uh, there are some uh, maybe uh, changes in the next few months' time because uh, now we are moving to uh, from the old data portal platform called OECD.stat to OECD exp Data Explorer. Then this uh, new platform, uh, you might see a slightly different uh, dissemination materials. But uh, for the next uh, half year, uh, at least we are able to uh, keep the uh, uh, current uh, OECD.stat platform. So that's it. And these are the, the links to the yeah, access to the databases. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nori, for this uh, super insightful helicopter overview and examples of, of what is really a mass of extremely useful work that is going on behind the, the this databases. And I'm actually quite confident that both delegates in the room and online attendees will be eager to share their thoughts and ask questions. I remind that for those of you in the room, you can raise your counter flags. And for the attendees in Zoom, you can please submit your questions using the Q&A function. We have about 10 minutes for this Q&A session. 
If we do not have time to answer all your questions, then the OECD Secretariat will come back to you uh, after the meeting. And to moderate this session, I warmly welcome Paul Schreier, who is uh, OECD's uh, Chief Statistician, who will be taking care of this. So, Paul, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Roman, and welcome to everyone. As you said, we have uh, a few minutes for uh, questions and answers, but I would still want to take uh, one minute to thank the ICIO TIVA team for their achievement. Uh, really, this is uh, a major step forward again, mapping out global production and trade in all its uh, complexity. I'm also impressed every time I see the many applications beyond TIVA, which uh, you know keep coming in with new uh, with new policy relevant questions. There's work involved, but the heavy lifting is done by the uh, ICIO infrastructure that is there. Finally, the work here also provides useful feedback for the statistical community. And uh, because we, we get the signals from demand uh, uh, that is ex expressed here, and uh, I'm, I'm very happy taking this back to the statistical community that provides a number of upstream inputs to this and more generally, so we are pleased to be partners in this activity. Now, let me open uh, the floor physically and virtually for uh, one or two uh, questions or remarks that you may have. And I will then turn back to uh, my colleagues. And uh, after that, we can move into the policy debate. So the floor is open for anyone who wants to uh, come in. And I see Italy has uh, a flag up. May I? Thank you very much. I'll be super fast. So we welcome this update. Um, absolutely super, super, super timely, as we saw also in the morning, uh, being able to monitor the fragmentation process uh, to assess vulnerabilities is something that we're really uh, looking forward to. We had a look at the highlights for Italy. And uh, we can tell you that it was nice to read, very rich, detailed. They offered a broad overview of all the engagement, the model participation, and uh, evidence also on uh, embodied emissions in global value chains are uh, super relevant also ahead in thinking about, like, again, all the discussion we had this morning. I have one general comment and a few specific remarks that we'll do probably later uh, one to one uh, with the with the authors. Uh, the general comment is possibly to make an effort if you haven't thought about that to make uh, this table data the raw data available to the researchers because it will be very, very useful uh, to integrate this uh, data with other official statistics and um, just a very small spoiler so not only this data. Uh, very interesting and useful for policymakers, government institutions, but also for central banks. So as a central banker, as an economist in a central bank, we are really we rely a lot on this information. And uh, let me signal that there is a forthcoming European system of central banks reports on trade fragmentation. It's being coordinated by the Bank of Italy and the European Central Bank. And most of the analysis will feature your data. So thank you very much for this amazing effort. Thank you. Concerning, uh, in the context of trade in uh, greenhouse gases, uh, is there any work going on to disaggregate the energy sources in the input output table into renewable and non-renewable sources to disaggregate raw materials into primary and secondary so that so as to have a better view of the circular uh, economy? And uh, the second uh, question is, which greenhouse gas emissions are currently available in the ICAO database used for calculating carbon uh, footprints? So let me see if there's any further intervention here or virtually. If not, uh, let me maybe hand back to my colleagues. I don't know, Nori or uh, who. Nori, would you like to respond? Please uh, go ahead. 
Thank you for the comments. Um, so for the, the just uh, questions about the GHGs. So um, we've been working on the uh, energy thing for a few sectors. Um, so that may be possible uh, for the let to be easy one like coal and gas. Um, maybe other energy sources could be a bit difficult, but it's it's we been uh, we also present that in the last year CIA or WPIA this meeting about the the yeah, possible split of that. And then the another one is uh, the type of the emissions covered in this. So uh, in the earlier uh, this morning, uh, there was a presentation on the carbon border adjustment. In that work, actually the uh, total GHG minus methane. So at least for the methane part and also the fossil fuel combustions we are able to split. And the other gases we haven't really able to explicitly split, but maybe with the help from uh, SDD on uh, with uh, the team in the National Account Division, maybe we are able to uh, work more to have a, a better uh, split for those uh, emissions. Uh, thank you, Nori. Um, I'm afraid this brings us already to the closure of the Q&A here. Let me just say that I was very pleased to hear directly from Italy about the usefulness of the country notes. I think you spoke for uh, many other uh, countries as well, because uh, generally they were very much welcomed. And uh, the fact that the central banks are, are interested in this work is is uh, good to hear. This is an important uh, community. Uh, I think there were uh, a number of, of other remarks or questions on the chat as well. Uh, we won't have time to deal with them uh, uh, right now. But the slides of the presentation will be made available on the TIVA website, so you can go in and uh, link uh, through to the various sources. And of course, uh, my colleagues will also be available for uh, written interaction that you may have with them. So once again, thank you for uh, this uh, presentation of the uh, new database. And uh, I now uh, hand over for the more policy related part of the event. Thank you very much, Paul. And thanks uh, to the colleagues who put on this uh, spot on questions. We will now shift uh, our focus to the uh, to the discussion of the policy implications of the ICIO uh, TIVA indicators. This session will be actually moderated by Marion Janssen, the director of the OECD Trade and Agriculture Directorate. And uh, we will have 30 minutes uh, for the panel and 10 to 15 minutes for questions and answers to catch up on the five minute delay that we have. But before we proceed, let me also give the floor to the chair of the OECD Committee on Industry, Innovation and Entrepreneurship, Dan Mawson. He will be saying a few a few words. Dan. Thank you, Roman. Um, so I'd really like to just quickly build on some of the marks uh, Paul Schreier made. And I was when I was asked to actually quickly comment on this, I thought about reflecting on how far we've come in terms of this type of analysis. So TIVA was launched, as I said earlier, about a decade ago, but built on a lot of preceding work. But particularly in the trade space, if you think back to the early academic work looking at this, it was focused on very narrow questions, such as what was the true content of China's exports from its electronics and advanced manufacturing sectors because of concerns that they were capturing a huge share of the export market in things like mobile phones. If you... Uh, roll forward to today, we now have a mammoth data set which covers a huge range of countries and sectors. And having talked to Colony's team and other people, that's true. Having also used it, an incredibly complicated piece of data work. But by linking it to the ICIO and then to other sources of data, such as unemployment, CO2, multinational enterprises, we can really basically apply it to a much richer range of interesting questions. And within the OECD, I think there's something like eight or nine committees at least now make quite a lot of use of TIVA. And it really shows the richness of this kind of data work in terms of as you gradually build on a good solid foundation, you can ask ever more interesting policy questions. And it's a great example where the OECD really adds value because they're pretty much one of the only organizations in the world that could possibly ever do this. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dan. And now, to run the policy panel, I pass on the floor to Marion. Thank you very much, Marion. 
Thank you, uh, Roman, and, and very uh, pleased to be here um, today. And uh, Dan already mentioned uh, the launch of the Trade in Value Added Database. Um, uh, I, I was actually in Geneva working at the WTO site on, the, on these data when uh, the data set was launched in 2013, at the time still as an OECD WTO uh, collaboration. Uh, so my name is Marianne Janssen, I'm the Director of the Trade and Agriculture Directorate, and the word trade already tells you that we have a particular stake in the T of the trade in value added uh, database, and you always have seen the trade committee popping up several times in the slides, uh, referring to the internal collaborations um, and the internal use of the data. But this panel is going to focus on uh, the use by external partners, um, very much in the in the space of of trade, notably. And I'll be very happy to welcome four panelists with us, and I'm going to introduce the four of them in the order in which they will intervene with us digitally. Kyoji Fukan, president of the IDE of Institute of Developing Economies, IDE Jetro in Japan. With us digitally, Philip Luck, deputy chief economist, US Department of State. With us in the room, very pleased, Paolo Passimeni, deputy chief economist of the European Commission DG Internal Market and Industry, and with us digitally, Richard Baldwin, Professor of International Economics uh, at the International Institute for Management and Development Business School, IMD, in Lausanne, Switzerland. And Richard, uh, what a pity that you're not here. No possibility to take a, a, a selfish a selfie, a shameless selfie with you in the room, but we are going to take a picture on the screen. Um, I have made... Uh, the painful experience when run, running hybrid meetings, that is very difficult for the moderator to stop the speakers who are online. I cannot throw severe uh, looks at them. I cannot hand over little pieces of paper. So Kyoji, Philip and Richard, I depend on your own discipline and maybe colleagues writing messages to you uh, for us to stick to the timetable. I would like to give the floor to Kyoji Fukao first for a five to six minute intervention, and I hope he will appear on the screen now. Thank you. Can you see me and hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. So first of all, I would like to congratulate the OECD, ICIO, and the TIVA teams. It's a great contribution. And as already mentioned, the wider coverage of countries and wider topics and uh, also, as uh, yeah, already mentioned, the trade in new indicators like trade in employment and trade in embodied CO2 emissions and foreign input reliance, etc., are also very useful. Let me share the screen. Can you see the screen? Yes, we can. Yeah. So I'm a president of IDE Jetro, and IDE Jetro is a heavy user of ICIO and TIBA. And we, with WTO and other institutions, we already published four global value chain development report from 2017. <coughs> To, to 2023. And also, we published more than 10 articles using uh, ICIO and TIBA. And we, using this new vintage, we will make more articles. And thank you very much for this new data. And uh, I would like to make some comments on the future potential of uh, IO. And, uh, I'm a member of CREMS database, so I'd like to combine the world input out of the table with CREMS type data. For that, and also analysis of productivity, we need improvement of IO tables in previous year prices, PYP, 
and linking I.O. tables with CREMS data, such as capital service input, FDI, and labor quality. And using these data, we could analyze how each country's TFE growth and changes in factor endowment affect global welfare. Marcel Tima and Ye already wrote a paper, and also our team recently wrote a paper. And the WIO database and OECD already provided some of such data, but I think we need more improvement. And as Yamano-san already pointed out, probably it's very difficult for some countries, but uh, I think this direction is important. The second potential is linking with domestic regions. Given the GBCs are rooted in domestic sources, large economies have, and large economies have high variation in the domestic side, like US, China, India, etc. And uh, already there are some works try to link domestic region, regional IO tables with worldwide IO tables like Men and Yamano. But I think further work on this direction is also important. And also, I, I direct another potential is more updated dimensions reflecting new GBC phenomenon, such as export controls and remote work and farm size, etc. And my fourth point is more indicators, like more indicators of GBC vulnerability and GBC networks. And also, I would like to point out there are more possible academic co collaboration on policy-oriented research. For example, now OECD and IDE JETRO are jointly trying to improve IO table using microdata, big data-based IO. So we call it a big data-based IO table we are trying to make. And that kind of activity is also important. I finish my yeah intervention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kyoji Fukawa, and thank you very much for sticking uh, so well to uh, to time. Um, you mentioned uh, the the interest in more um, more countries, um, more detail in the data. Uh, that's also a, a question we have uh, repeatedly heard um, in our um, exchanges with experts and with members of the of the trade uh, committee. Uh, Paul uh, Schreier referred to the heavy lifting that goes into um, into uh, creating the databases. Uh, definitely ready to go for even heavier lifting um, to the extent that this um, will be made uh, possible. But let's discuss. Uh, let's go further and pass the floor. Let's move from Tokyo to Washington and allow me to pass the floor to Philip Luck at the U.S. Department of State. Philip, are you with us? Yes, I am. Uh, apologies. I think my camera doesn't seem to be working, so uh, you'll just have to trust that I put a tie on at 530 in the morning, which I did. Um, so thank you so much for uh, for <clears throat> allowing me to speak here today. Um, it's really exciting as a, a trade economist who spent my entire career thinking about global value chains. Uh, this is just a really exciting day, and uh, I just can't uh, thank uh, the group enough for all the amazing work they've done it's just a huge lift. Uh, I just want to spend a few minutes talking a little bit about how you know this type of data is invaluable with a, within a foreign policy uh, perspective. Uh, and then even though I just said this is such a heavy lift, I, I am going to do the same thing and I'm going to ask for more uh, at, at the end as well. Um, the first thing I want to note is that this is an incredibly important time for this type of work. Um, there's almost no subject that I think about uh, and talk to principals about that doesn't isn't in some way better informed by data like this. Uh, whether it's thinking about the proper mechanisms for carbon abatement, as we saw this morning, and how our different policies can be thought of in this global way through to the data sets. Uh, whether it's thinking about how global shocks might transmit through uh, through the global economy and looking forward to different risks we might face, um, or whether it's more granular than that, where it's thinking about how can we think about the supply chain of semiconductors. 
um, and how can we look at the, these things better. Um, the other large area where this is incredibly valued to my work is thinking about economic interdependence um, and ways in which that can be increased or also ways in which it can potentially be weaponized. Um, so Tiva and other data sets like this or this type of work is just incredibly valuable for all of these lines of effort. Um, I was very heartened by, or it was very nice to hear from, from Gary and others about, you know, where we've come from and where we are now. And, and it makes me very excited about where we'll be a few years from now in terms of coverage and speed of data coming out uh, and granularity. And so to that last point, um, I would just like to say, you know, in terms of my, you know, asking for more, even though you've delivered so much, uh, the big ask here, which again, is just incredibly hard, uh, but I would love, you know, as the next round of this going to statistical agencies and, and talking with them and, and getting better access to, to data, um, how we can get more granularity. This data set is, uh, enormously valuable, but with every incremental increase in granularity, with every, you know, degree to which we can make this, you know, twice or three times as granular, uh, the, the ability for people in positions like mine and others to use this to make good policy uh, go up exponentially. So that's my one enormous ask, uh, and uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Philip, and thank you for highlighting the the relevance of this data set in this um, in, in this particular uh, period. Also, um, at the OECD, um, we um, have been doing work uh, on issues like uh, interdependencies on critical raw materials for the green transition, and uh, these type of studies have um, drawn a lot of attention because uh, they are so relevant uh, for ongoing policy debates at the highest level. Um, with this, uh, from Washington to Paris now, uh, Paolo Passimeni, I would be happy to pass over the floor to you. Thank you. To Paris with a view from Brussels, let's say. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for, for the invitation, for the panel, but most of all, thanks, thanks a lot for developing this instrument, which for us is, and I want to stress this, is absolutely fundamental. So the value for money of the work that you do in producing this public good uh, for academia, but for policy making is extremely high. It's really, it's really a fundamental instrument. Now, uh, some of the points uh, I want to make uh, somehow uh, are similar to what Phil has just said for us. Uh, the TIVA indicators have been fundamental in our work to, un to better understand the production structure of critical supply chains, to understand the potential spillovers of production across sectors and across countries, to better understand at sectoral level the EU foreign dependencies. So this is, let's say, uh, similar to what Phil has highlighted. And uh, in fact, we have also had some interesting uh, exchanges with, uh, with his team, um, but it's not only that for us. For us in particular, we are the uh, Directorate General of the Commission, which is in charge of the single market. TIVA is also important to understand the internal linkages and the internal functioning of the single market. So for us, it has also these, let's say, second and double dimension of helping us better understanding how our single market works. And that maybe I would say, if not more important, but is certainly as important as the, uh, of course, uh, usefulness for international trade and external uh, uh, dependencies and all, all, all this work. Now, since you ask for complete, concrete examples of research uh, uh, conducted uh, where the use of TIVA was particularly useful. If I may, I will tell you uh, an anecdote, uh, kind of a personal anecdote. It was uh, um, end of February, beginning of March 2020, when the world was going to be shaken up by the epidemic, then became a pandemic. 
and we were trying to understand what was going on, what, what was going on, and what the, the impact on the economy was going to be. Uh, in those weeks, uh, I remember having to find some um, different way to estimate uh, or to guesstimate uh, the potential impact of what was going on. Our official um, macroeconomic models were predicting for the EU a recession of minus 1.1 in mid-March. But thanks to the use of TIVA and thanks to the possibility to understand the cross-sectoral uh, linkages in value added produced by one sector and then used in another sector and the cross-country uh, linkages and putting those things together, we could build a very, a very rudimentary model. And through that model, we could shut down some sectors in some countries with a different, uh, uh, let's say, uh, length. And through that operation, we came out already in mid-March 2020 with an estimate of minus seven, minus eight recession for the EU. That was, of course, internal. Uh, then it, towards the end of March, it was leaked to the press. Of course, uh, everybody denied having done that. But uh, um, 10 days later, the IMF came out with a minus 9% uh, prediction. Then the OECD came out with a similar prediction. And then everybody came out with the same prediction, which was quite close to the final outcome in terms of a recession. Of the so just to highlight how important TIVA was, not just in understanding international trade, but also in, under in understanding internal dynamics within the EU and within the single market. And finally, in terms of forward looking uh, uh, ideas or wish list, uh, I must say that uh, Nori, uh, basically you spoiled all my points. Mm -hmm. And that's good because it means that uh, in your work plans, you have, you have already all the points I want to make. In particular, the first one was of course, uh, time and better updated. I wanted to suggest a kind of now casting to be then reviewed uh, as the new official data came out uh, and you have already written work plan in your work plan. Another point we wanted to make is about the link with the types of skills, employment types of skills, and you have it in your work plan. And then it's very welcome the link with your MNA, M and E uh, database. So, and of course, the more disaggregated data uh, you have, the better. So yes, I will conclude with this, just uh, uh, repeating how important this product is for us. Uh, thank you, uh, Paolo. Thank you for uh, emphasizing the public good char uh, character of this, um, of this data uh, set. And indeed also the, um, the, the potential, the, importance of uh, views that has been made of this tool in situations of crisis. And um, unfortunately, we have had too many of those uh, moments in recent um, in recent years. Uh, let me go then after Tokyo, Washington, Paris and Brussels now to uh, not Geneva, but Lausanne. Uh, Richard, are you with us? And if yes, please take the floor. Yes, Th thank you very much, Marianne. Um, so what I wanted to do was first uh, echo or, or add my thanks to the ICO TIVA team for having done this fantastic job. It's really an important contribution, as we've heard many, many uh, from many uh, participants. And uh, personally, we have uh, been using it um, quite a lot. I would just sort of one of the kind of points I think it's worth stressing as to why this is so useful for so many things is essentially this ICIO is the entire world economy in data. All the connections between all the sectors and all the countries, all the flows, it's the production, that's all there. And once you start thinking about how the world economy is going, this actually is uh, an a incredibly useful source to see what the world economy is and in particular how it's changing. So that's why I think it's so important that this is updated, uh, that these coming come beyond 2018, which was a little bit old to something newer. It'll be an even more interesting when we get the post COVID numbers to see uh, how that whole thing changed. So 
Let me just start with the thanks. Now, let me share my screen. Most of my comments are going to be about a, uh, where's the share, share the screen. There's my slides. And do you see the slides are big now? Let's see here. There we go, okay. So uh, well, I'm gonna talk a little bit about new uses for the new TIVA data set or the or, yeah, ICIO data set. And mostly it's gonna be based around a paper that uh, I've, I've done for the Brookings paper, Economic Activities uh, this fall with Rebecca Friedman and Angelos Theodokopoulos. And that's um, a paper which is measuring US supply chain exposure. And we've heard a couple of uh, comments on how useful it is to be able to uh, tra trace out exposure. And this paper that we did um, is, is looking at, well, ex US exposure all, overall, but with quite a lot of emphasis on the exposure to um, China. And by the way, that graphic you see next to the title, I generated that in about 30 seconds with uh, chat GPT 4.0. So if you haven't started to play with the graphic generator, it's absolutely incredible. Okay, so let me first talk about why uh, we should potentially need a new set of indicators when it comes to measuring supply chain exposure issues. And uh, as Nori said, the, the, one of the extensions has been to use gross indicators of supply chains instead of just uh, value added chains. And so the question is, why do we need new gross trade indicators? And the answer that we've given our Brookings paper and other work that we've done uh, last year is shocks, my dear boy, shocks, which is the, uh, the thing that um, Harold Macmillan said when he asked, what is the most challenging thing to be a premiership? And as we've heard a couple times, uh, shocks are hitting supply chains or global value chains in a way that they hadn't done before. And we, we kind of identify at least one of the big changes is not so much that the supply chains changed, but the nature of the shocks changed. And they seem to have shifted from something that was typically idiosyncratic, say one sector, one country for a few months, something that you could just reliably leave to firms it, to something that was much more systemic and uh, longer lasting that governments might have to get involved with. And we have seen governments intervening in that uh, quite ex extensively. Now, the thing is that the most of the value chain indicators before like backward and forward linkages were based on value added and that was viewed as a, a big plus because it avoided the double counting. But the trouble with the shocks we're seeing now in supply chain disruptions is the shocks happen to gross flows, not value-added flows. And a, a, a telling example is when some truckers blocked the bridge between the US car industry and the Canadian car industry, the Ambassador Bridge. They didn't just block the value-added that was coming from Canada to the United States, they blocked the entire gross flow. So in many, in many ways, you, you want to be using gross flows in order to measure the true exposure. Now, there's two critical aspects you need this ICIO data for. First of all, it distinguishes between intermediate and final goods, which is absolutely critical when you're looking at supply chains. And this is possible with standard trade data, but it's very messy. The second is it identifies which are the importing and exporting sectors. So you can actually see which sector is importing from which sector in which country. That's impossible with regular trade data. So you have to go to something like ICIO data. Now, all the work I'm gonna talk about and all the work that was in our Brookings paper is on the import side, but uh, you can do all these things on the export side. And Nori mentioned the, um, the FEAR measure and the FMR measures. One, FEAR is on the import side and FMR is on the export side, but there's a bunch of other measures that are gonna be up there. They're all available um, on the, on the uh, website when it gets put up. And this one may become very important if we ever go to dueling embargoes between you know geoeconomic conflicts leading to this country putting an embargo on that and another one putting an embargo on that. Then what you want to be doing is looking at the exposure of your exports to foreign markets, not the exposure of your, of your production to imports. So we'll watch this space. We'll probably have to write some of those papers. I'm, I'm un unlike the other speakers, I'm going on way too long. So anyways, with this gross trade flows, there's really two ones, face value, which is the intermediate purchase from tier one suppliers, which you see straight in the TV data. And then the look through basis, which is all the intermediate purchases directly and indirectly, where you need to calculate it with the ONTF inverse to figure out 
what China is selling to Canada that's putting in parts that are then sold to the United States. And we call the difference between this hidden exposure, and I want to show a couple, one chart at least uh, that, that shows how important this difference is. So here is a, uh, a chart which is looking at who is the top supplier for U.S. industries. And what this percentage is, it's the percentage of manufacturing sectors where China, Canada, Mexico, or some other country are the top supplier to these industries. And if you look at the face value, which is a directly observed, you can see China's, uh, this is 2018, is super important, so over 60%. But if you use a look through, they are the top supplier in all the sectors except one, which is pharmaceuticals. That's the, the first part of hidden exposure. Another aspect which you can see with the data is how fast this change. So if we do this same chart, looking at 1995 and 1995, 2018, you'll see that the role of China has changed radically. In the 1995, there wasn't that big of a difference between face value and, and look through because China wasn't embedded in everybody's supply chains back then. And now they're really dominant. The next chart I want to show you kind of explaining one of the things you can use, the, to, one of the facts that's really kind of driving the big changes in this uh, database. And that's China's production of manufacturing intermediates rose rapidly and is now dominant. So if you go from the beginning, 1995, up to 2008, you can see China went from under 10% to now being the largest supplier. In fact, so large that it's larger than all the other developed countries together. So it's really become the world's OPEC for industrial inputs. And if you look for all production from China, it's nowhere near that. So it turns out China's role in global supply chains as a provider of intermediate inputs is even larger than their role in manufacturing as a whole. So I am out of time here, uh, but I, I, if I could, uh, I, I can't see the, uh, the uh, let me go, come to the Zoom and see how much, how upset Marianne is with me for having gone on for so long. Oh, I got to stop sharing. Here we go. Okay. Do I have two more minutes, Marianne? No, no, Richard, you now have lose, used up all the time that the others had saved. Okay, so and I'll stop so there. It, Thanks. It, it would be perfect to stop now because then I can start the uh, Q&A uh, perfectly on time. Um, and um, with this, I would like to open uh, the floor. I suggest that I take um, maybe three questions and then uh, go back to the panel. And if we then have time, uh, we go for a second round of of questions, and I understand that I will have help for the online online questions. So please, um, in this room, I think you have seen a, a few impressive um, uh, pictures there. In particular, the the the, the color of red increasing uh, on the screen there, uh, uh, Richard. That was quite uh, quite a visual um, reflection of what has been happening in global supply chains over time in recent decades. Um, the floor. It's open for questions. Please raise your flags. Okay, as people are trying to come up with questions, maybe I give Paul the floor because we heard the term now casting. And I do know that there is uh, work going on in his uh, directorate in, in this space. Maybe you would, would like to say a few words on that, uh, Paul. Thank you, Marian. Uh, very happy to, uh, to report on uh, a, a sort of a complementary uh, activity to the, the real release uh, of uh, the data here. We've been experimenting with uh, now casting a subset of the TIVA indicators for the years 21 and uh, 22. So it's not a now cast of the whole database. It's a now cast of a subset of uh, TIVA indicators to get a sense for what may be or what may have happened uh, during this uh, turbulent uh, period. This is a uh, uh, under under construction, uh, uh, so to say, but tries to complement the current uh, uh, the uh, uh, the current data, and of course, as soon as the the full database is available for the years uh, in question, the uh, uh, nowcasts will be uh, invalidated or replaced by the by the real uh, data. 
I'd just like to pick up on two things that were actually uh, proposed by the panel. One was uh, on the call for greater granularity. I mean, this sort of is a is a is a a call also for the statistical community to to see what can be done with one of the key elements of this ICIO that is supply use tables, which sit somewhere uh, uh, upstream. And uh, uh, this is certainly a dialogue to be had with uh, the Committee on Statistics, Statistical Policy, the national accountants there to see what, what can be done to live up to this, uh, to this uh, demand. And similarly, uh, there was a question about uh, tables in constant prices. And uh, again, that would be very valuable because it, as it was said, that would allow the link to productivity measurement, which is another uh, uh, another highly relevant uh, uh, topic. Um, thank you, Paul. And, and, and I mean, the, on the trade side, we already have the constant price um, aspect of, um, of these data. I don't know that Richard can speak for at least two more minutes, but Paolo, um, would you do you would you like to add something to what you have just heard or anybody else here? And then I'll give the floor to Richard or, of course, to anybody who wants to ask a question. Yes, talking about currencies. First of all, having the data in Euro, that would be even better for us, <laughs> especially for our internal analysis. And definitely in constant prices, uh, that's also something that would be very useful because so far what we do is basically transform everything into shares, into, into indexes, basically. Um, and then, uh, yes, just to highlight uh, that, well, I presented an example but since then, since 2020, basically, we have had so many uh, structural shocks in the economy that uh, the sectoral dimension and the uh, international value chain detail has become more prominent. Honestly, I think the TIVA would have been, I mean, was already useful before 2020, but afterwards it has become even uh, even more important so this is really and something i mean everything suggests that is going to be uh, still very important uh, last point is about the um, the now casting of 21 22 i've not understood if that will be uh, available online or if uh, okay or if we can request uh, let's say some uh, um, some information about that Thank you, Paolo. And, and indeed, uh, um, you mentioned that in recent years, TIVA has become even more, um, ICIO TIVA has become even more relevant for policy making. And it's also in this period where the request for more granularity in order to understand individual supply chains better and uh, the demand for more up to date information, uh, given that the, the space between crises unfortunately has shrunk. Um, um, and ideally, even to look into the future to understand what can happen tomorrow, um, uh, that demand has in, increased. And you may all have noticed that we have increased the speed with which we have been updating the data set. Um, Antoine uh, from the Secretariat uh, would like to take the floor, please. Thank you, Thank you Marianne. Just to, to add a, a point on um, some of the uh, questions that were raised during the discussion. So. So first, following also the intervention of uh, Richard, I would like to highlight that uh, these uh, indicators of FIR, FMR, FPMEPS, FPEX, which are also highlighted in the Brookings paper, will be made available on the on the web page uh, of the ICIO TIVA indicators. So there is a specific web page on that, and it's now uh, online this morning. Uh, the second point is that uh, we really uh, acknowledge that there is a need for more granularity uh, in uh, in the data sets for uh, identifying more uh, closely the vulnerabilities in the supply chain. So uh, while we are thinking in terms of how to uh, bring more granularity in the ICAO tables in particular, uh, we, we presented this morning in particular at CIAE, uh, a work that brings together uh, the, the ICAO tables together with more profitable trade data. And this is a more hybrid way of going towards <clears throat> having more granularity in the analysis to identify the impact, the impact of supply shocks for, for downstream production. So we, we think we go, we started to go into this, this direction. Thank you, Antoine and Richard, if you are still with us. 
Uh, definitely two minutes are possible, even more. Over to you, Richard. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Marianne. So what I what I would wanted to do with uh, my two minutes, which uh, may may actually be three minutes, uh, is talk about some other future uses uh, of this data set. Um, the the main theme is that I think that world commerce is shifting out of manufacturing and into services. If you look at the simple facts, the uh, manufactured to GDP ratio. Manufactured trade to GDP ratios have stagnated or fallen for almost 10 years now, but the service trade to service uh, value added has been soaring. It's continued to, to rise. And if that rise continues, it will begin to uh, take up a, quite a large share of international commerce. And it seems clear to me that that's the way it's going to go. So the, the point there is that what we're seeing now is the development of service value chains which are similar to global value chains, which almost, almost universally used to refer to manufacturing, but they're different in, in, in different ways. Moreover, the, this kind of uh, what I call telemigration or working from home when home is abroad was opening up opportunities for office workers in emerging markets to participate in global value chains. And they are value chains because they're providing, for the most part, intermediate services or B2B and the way that this is spreading is, I think, quite distinct from the way global value chains spread in manufacturing. And I think it will be very important for development going forward and the impact on uh, advanced economies going forward will be quite different. So that's the first thing, anything to do with services and service value chains. And the other is this: uh, the impact of the de-risking policies, or uh, there's all sorts of words for it, decoupling, whatever, to trace out what is actually happening to the supply chain. And there's been a number of papers which, which use just standard trade data to refer to whack-a-mole trade, where trade imports from China directly go down, but then imports from Vietnam go up and imports from China to Vietnam go up. So it's kind of not really uh, you know, changing the dependence on China, just to take one example. And I think tracing that out will be uh, a, another use of this, very importantly, to see which of these uh, disengagement or de-risking policies are really affecting things and what are the real facts in terms of reshoring, offshoring, nearshoring, friendshoring, and all that sort of stuff. I think that's a whole whole new set of issues that this could be used for. So I think I've used more than my two minutes, and so I'll, I'll stop there. And uh, maybe we can answer questions if, we, if there are any. Thank you very much, um, uh, Richard, also for making the link to this, uh, to some of these ongoing debates, indeed, uh, uh, the, 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 the near-shoring, the friend-shoring, and the use of TIVA um, for this kind of um, assessments. Uh, Philip Luck, uh, Kyoji Fukan, does any of you want to add uh, to what you have just been hearing in the discussion? No, I don't have at this moment. Okay, Philip? Uh, me neither, other than to say that uh, I completely agree with everything Richard just said in terms of this type of data is incredibly important for uh, understanding the evolution of dependencies, uh, and it's a very policy relevant at this moment. Thank you. If there are no further questions in the room, no online, no, then I'll actually be able to stop early. And uh, thank uh, the four panelists, Kyoji, Philip, Paolo, and uh, Richard, for um, their contributions and for um, telling us uh, how important this public good um, that the OECD puts at the disposal um, of policymakers, uh, think tanks, academic institutions, and other IOs, uh, how important this public good is, and in particular has been in recent uh, years. Um, we in the uh, Trade and Agriculture Directorate will uh, definitely continue to be a heavy user of these, uh, of these data and a heavy contrib contributor to making these data available uh, to the public at large. With this, uh, Roman, uh, I will give the floor back to you for a few concluding remarks. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Marion and Thanks a lot to Nori and our four top panelists. This was a much appreciated uh, exchange and a very fruitful one with also a lot of hints about uh, future avenues. 
And to wrap up, let me just emphasize once again how useful this public good uh, is in the form of ICIO tables, TIVA, and other global value chain indicators that are related to provide researchers, but also to provide policymakers and policy analysts with a rich set of tools that can serve for multiple purposes. We have heard many of those here. Understanding regional and global interconnectedness of economies, uh, potential vulnerabilities in global value chains and links to dependencies, like we have seen this morning in the CIIE, how employment is driven by demand abroad, how domestic demand relates to greenhouse gas emissions in other countries, the role of multinational enterprises in global value chains, and also from the EU perspective, my colleague Paolo was saying before that this was very central for us to run exercises ranging from measuring spillover effects across the single market to the impact of disruption of disruptions on the industrial ecosystems at the EU level. And you can do much, much more than that. And this already with a rather granular perspective with the data. So I just wanted to end up by saying the construction of these ICO tables is a very complex, uh, very data intensive, very time consuming and a very kind of patient endeavor. And it requires a lot of deep knowledge of many sources of statistics, national and international. So I would like to end up by expressing my gratitude and also as vice chair of the CIA committee and having the chair sitting next to me, I think also the committee's uh, gratitude to the OECD's um, ICIO TIVA team for this very impressive work. So many thanks to, to Chiara, to Colin, to Nori, to Agnes, and to all the other STI colleagues that are in the in the TIVA team. We encourage everybody to make the very best use of the ICIO TIVA uh, database and all the rich information that you have and you will have uh, reinforced in the, in the uh, website. Uh, please don't hesitate to contact the OECD Secretariat if you have any comments and suggestions that you could not make today on this work. And we look definitely forward to the next updates. I think one of the main conclusions of the meeting today, as Marion just underlined, is that there are a lot of avid users of this uh, super useful tool. So finally, I just want to extend my thanks to everybody in the room and the participants online for their questions and just uh, close the meeting at this point. So thank you very much, everybody.